Hi folks, I see a few of you have hopped on. Um, we'll get started at the top of the hour sharp. Uh, so feel free to get comfortable and uh, we'll get started soon. Hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon, depending on uh, what time zone you're, you're uh, dialing in from. Uh, so thanks for joining today. Some of you were uh, joined yesterday's uh, webinar, so it's great to see you back. And uh, some of you I've uh, worked with in the past, so it's nice to see your names pop up. And then for those of you who I haven't uh, had a chance to meet directly, just welcome and uh, looking forward to doing the session. So just a couple of housekeeping uh, things. Uh, everybody is on mute. Uh, just so we can avoid the, the whole background noise side of, side of things. However, I'll be going through the session and asking questions and doing polls. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you get a chance, um, we'll, uh, 
we'll be asking some questions and you'll be answering some polls. And so uh, just a real quick check. Can everybody see my screen? You should be able to see the slide where it says navigating in your career in 2020. Uh, so you can just send me a little chat. Okay, great. Um, okay. So uh, I'll jump right in. And as you have questions, feel free to throw it in the chat or you can put it in the Q&A. Um, you can send it to me directly private or you can send it to the group. I'm gonna be checking the uh, chat and the Q&A as we go along. And yeah, good morning. Um, yay. Uh, so anyways, so we're, gonna, we're gonna jump in and we're gonna talk about career, which um, in 2020 has, has gotten um, pretty crazy. And uh, there's some things that are tried and true that don't change, but we have to take into consideration what's going on in 2020. And so, um, you know, the, the, there was a question before I dive into the content, there was a question that came up yesterday in, in the webinar that we had around performance management. And um, the, the question was, what about, you know, promotions during this time? Are people still considering them, you know, during budget, overview, or end of year, that type of thing? And I'll just, I'll share my experience and, you know, by all means, take it with a grain of salt because you've got to walk into your work environments and you know your culture and, and, and so, you know, align it there. But I'm, I'm coming from, you know, after 2008's economic downturn and working internally and running an organization and having people kind of vying for promotions. Um, and anyone who's, who's had sessions with me before, uh, I've emphasized I do not see promotions as rewards. I see them as new positions and they need a business case behind them. Um, so, you know, good. Okay, good, Amy. Um, so when, you, when you're thinking about that and the promotions, I think one, if you're thinking of promotions for yourself or even for your team, really think about timing. And I don't mean this as a bypass what needs to happen because you don't want to be a squeaky wheel during a bad time. But I do think tone and timing is important. Uh, during the economic downturn, I was really thoughtful about where I discussed, you know, moving people into different positions or even myself, because really during that time, it's a little bit of survival. And I want to make sure that I'm showing up as somebody who's supporting the overall picture, not just my own needs. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't go in and I didn't talk to people about, um, you know, changing uh, positions. But I emphasize more around making sure that we were delivering impact and that people were stretching into areas that they wanted to deliver in. And then when the timing was right, really making that business case for why the position needs to exist in the first place. <clears throat> because during times like this, people, um, organizations are, are kind of looking at things through a fine tooth comb around um, whether or not they, they should have these positions. Are they necessary for, for the business right now? Are they essential? And you know, that might feel cold, that might feel like the company doesn't care, but you know, look, if the company can't stay in business, then nobody has a job. So people have to make those decisions. My experience has been the larger the company, the more detached the process is. So that means somebody in accounting or somebody in comps and benefits who may or may not know the people on the team have to look through and from an objective lens go, does it make sense that we're investing in these positions or these departments? So I say all of that not to freak people out and say, oh, everybody's you know, uh, in danger of things, but you know, let's be realistic. This is tough times. People are gonna be examining what's, what's important, what's impactful, what's not. So when we're thinking about promotions, I would just say, let's remove the fear of like, are you climbing fast enough? And instead go, you know, what position really should be, you know, exist in our in our department and who's the best fit for it and if that means moving somebody into a new position with a different title then great there's a business case behind it but i do recommend that we move away from this idea of either i or the person reporting to me has worked hard and deserves this promotion um, it's not going to make a strong business case at this time and instead coming from a place of this is our vision for what we want to do for the organization and and here's the how the org chart should look and this is why. It's just a stronger case to come from. So I throw that out there because it came up yesterday. I think it's applicable to what's going on today, but not everybody is in the same position. So let's talk about this. So today we're gonna to talk about what are the new rules of career planning? And these are semi new because I've been talking about these for a while. Um, I think they're very applicable during this time. I actually realized these rules after 9-11 um, and I got laid off. 
and um, and then you know worked internally again and then started to notice like we can't operate the same way as we did before. We have to operate in as business owners of our own career, and so that looks different than maybe what we've been groomed to think. Next, identify what stage you are in for your career planning. I'll talk about that, and then. Um, Looking at, review the critical steps to take right now. What should you be doing right now? Uh, and I'm gonna look at all the different places that people might be. It might be that you're currently working uh, for an organization. It might be that you're furloughed. It might be that you were laid off. Um, so we're gonna talk about all those and have some tips around that. And ideally address everybody in any, any scenario that you might be in. Okay. So question. What is your current career status? And I'm gonna send out a poll for you. Um, let me send this out um, and uh, let's see what some answers are. And it's anonymous, so feel free to answer. But I've got, you're an overworked essential, meaning you're working crazy hours and more hours than you've ever done before. You're working, meaning you're employed, but it doesn't feel as productive. It doesn't feel as clear as to what you're, you're gonna do. You're furloughed with a clear end date, meaning you know that this is coming to an end, you'll come back to work. You're furloughed with no clear end date. Um, so you're just kind of, in, you're feeling that limbo a little bit. Um, you're laid off, but you're set up in a situation where you can take a pause and maybe, you know, take a breather and think about, think about what's going on here. Um, and then the last one is laid off and, and looking, no, I need to, I need to get to work. Um, and then the last is master of my own doing and immune uh, to, it, got, it cut off, got cut off here, but immune to employment status. Um, I am actually a mix of not all that productive and overworked depending on the day. That makes uh, sense, um, a, a lot of sense actually. And I think people are, are fluxing in between that. So if it allows you to, I don't know if it'll allow you to pick two, feel free to, to hit both and see what that happens. Um, looks like the majority of folks that are coming in, we've got uh, working but not as productive and some working essential. And then a few people, and then oh, we've got some people in master of my own domain. I love it, I love it. I, uh, I, I shoot for that every day, it doesn't always happen. Um, I think that's the greatest place to come from. And I think that, you know, if you're gonna be financially secure, you've just gotta have an attitude of, you know you can handle anything that gets thrown your way, which is, you know, the definition, excuse my French, of a badass. So, you know, congrats, congrats to all of you. Um, okay, so I just, I'd like to know, I'll, I'll be talking about all three of these, but I, I wanna know, um, you know, who, who my audience is and how to, how to make sure I'm supporting. Um, okay, so, well, let's talk about what do we do. So some of you may be familiar, I know some of you have sat through my classes before and, um, and has seen this, this, this little pyramid, For, but those that haven't, this is what I call pyramid of purpose or your pop. And anytime someone's coming to me for career uh, support, I, I want to first get clear as to what their purpose in life is. Your life is bigger than your job. And I know right now um, it may not feel that way. It may not feel that way because you're swamped. It may not feel that way because it's so tied to our survival and the fear that comes around job security. Um, but if we could just take a pause and know that this too shall pass, in this, your, your lifetime, you're bigger than your job. You've got, and that doesn't mean that your job's not critical. My job's, a, 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 the work I do is a huge part of what I, uh, my life. But your life is bigger than that. I, and I just want to remind you, your life is bigger than surviving COVID. And so when you think of your life and your purpose on this planet, you know, what do you want that to be? And so I, I, I like to ask the question, and I'll go through what these other layers mean in a second, but I want you to think for a minute about your purpose. And it doesn't have to be grand, it doesn't have to be Mother Teresa level kind of stuff. Uh, I, I use my brother as an example because his purpose is just to see the world. He loves travel, um, he, he loves to just see different things. We grew up in a small desert town and we didn't see a whole lot of different growing up, so he's pretty passionate about getting out and seeing different things. Um, it has zero to do with the helping the world or saving humanity. It all comes down to just seeing the world. And uh, because of that, he lines up, and I'll, I'll walk through the layers right now as you're, as you're thinking to yourself, well, what, what, what do I want my life to be about? The question I ask, and that's what I'll have you kind of roll around in your head a little bit, is if you're 105, I pick that age because I think that's a pretty ripe age to, to, to live to, and you're able to look back on your life, you know, what do you want to say about it? And, and don't make that a paragraph. Like I said, my brother is, see the world. See the world as intangible. 
Mine is help people be who they're supposed to be and as many as possible. Um, those are all intangible. We're the only ones that are gonna be able to look back on our lives and say whether or not we felt we, we, we did that. Um, and so it can be very simple. Um, and some people, they just wanna be a good parent. Some people um, want to, to, to be able to, you know, leave something lasting and meaningful. Um, but it should be something intangible that kind of speaks to what would make you feel like, and it might even be, I lived a full life, whatever that happens to be. So that pop is something intangible. So let that float in your head. I'm going to, I'm going to give kind of a few seconds of quiet. If you're comfortable and you've thought of it or you know it, you can feel free to either send it in the chat or to the group, or you can just select to send it to me. I won't share whose it was. Keep thinking about it. And, and I'm gonna start talking about what these other layers mean. And that might help kind of clarify for some of you what your pop is. And here's the thing, this is a big deep question. So if it doesn't immediately come to you, don't worry about it. I do recommend that you start writing down thoughts that are coming to your head. When you think of 105, what do I wanna say about my life? Just start writing those down. It'll start to clarify for you. Um, when you look at these layers, the, the, the pyramid is built from bricks. The bricks are tangible. Um, oh, we got some coming in. Enjoy life, not stress the small things. Oh, wouldn't that, that's a, that would be an amazing feat, especially, especially for someone as neurotic as me. Um, uh, every wonderment of the human engagement, wonders of, of that in the world. Oh, that'd be great. Um, allow disadvantaged children in the world have a shot to the American dream in their home country. Oh, interesting. I would say, so this is, you know, thank you for sharing this, and I'm not, I'm not picking that apart, but I want to kind of, that's a good example for me to show you what bricks are. So bricks are the tangible. So there's a couple of things. It's very crystallized, um, what you've got here. I think it's an actually a really great goal because it's tangible. Um, but when I look at this, so disadvantaged children. So that's a particular group of folks. Um, I might even say broaden it to have the pop be children. And then one of the bricks down there could be your focus, you know, disadvantaged children could be one of the bricks where that's my focus right now. 10 years from now, you might broaden it. Um, the, part, part, the idea of the pop should be that it's broad enough that it continues to invite possibilities. Um, the bricks can be placed in, in certain places. And so disadvantaged children in the world have a shot at the American dream in their home country. So even that, the shot at the American dream in home country, those are particular bricks as a, a certain way. So it could just be, I'm gonna help children. And then the bricks, those high priority bricks, the ones that directly support your pop, it might be disadvantaged. Children are, are a population that you're focusing on right now. Um, the American dream and your definition of that and, and in their home country is the location. So that might, those might be bricks that fit into the high priority because they really define what you're doing. So for me, I wanna help people be who they're supposed to be. My high priority brick is my work and especially the career coaching that I do. Um, but then, because I have this broad umbrella, it applies to a lot of different things. It even applies to, I have a stepson now. And so I try to remember, well, my purpose is to help people be who they're supposed to be. He's not my job um, in terms of like the work that I do. But then every time I engage with him, I try to think, how am I helping him be who he's supposed to be versus who I want him to be? <laughs> um, so this is an example of how you can kind of um, move those things around so that you're always using the pop as like a way to keep open. Uh, my purpose is to transform young people's lives for the better through education. So I'd say young people transform young people's lives. I didn't say transform people's lives because young people may be what you're focused on now, but you leave it open to it might be broader later. Make young a demographic, a brick, and then education a brick. Now that might be the brick that you use your entire life, um, but because it's tangible, we're starting to get into the details, it becomes a brick. Uh, enjoy family, nature, food, and, and reading. Yeah, enjoy life, it sounds like. And then and those might be the, the, the major bricks um, that you have. Uh, I want to facilitate student career pathways to professional success, high wage, high demand pathways. I love that. I, 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 I push a little bit. I love it. I mean, definitely do it. So student career pathways is very tangible. That feels like a brick and it is probably your high, high priority brick. Um, and then high wage, high demand pathways. So that's a quality of the brick. Um, I think that's in there. Keep it in there. And but let's let's at the pop, 
and don't let me, you know, force feed anything on, on anybody, but I would say, you know, what's the why behind why you want to do that? What's, what is, what is the meaning behind that? And then it might just be, I want to set people up for, for, for financial freedom or set them up for uh, their greatest success. And that leaves a very broad thing because those bricks that I'm going to go through, those different layers, you can kind of move them around. Each year you might shuffle them around a little bit. Sometimes your whole life, a brick stays in one position um, to create impactful and meaningful stories. Okay, that's nice and broad. You know, stories are obviously, you know, there's a little tangible around it. Um, but I, don't, I, I think it's okay to have something that's direction setting. Um, so to create impactful and meaningful stories, that's, that, that keeps it pretty broad. And that could be through a lot of different things. You tell stories in every walk of life. Um, okay. Um, continually learn and grow. Love it. And every year when you start your year, if that's your purpose in life is to just make sure every year is something about learning and growing, you can think to yourself, you know, how am I going to learn and grow this year? What am I going to prioritize? Maybe I'm going to learn and grow with how I am in, within my personal life and how I take care of myself. And that's going to be my evolution this year. Maybe next year it's going to be something different. So thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to get to see what these are. Oh, I, I, I love this. Uh, I'm here to thrive, survive, and be alive. Cancer survivor. Oh, thank you for, for, for sharing this. Help others professionally and personally like those before me. Help me through this process. Every day, one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time, one second at a time, and one breath at a time. I'm not here to be right. I'm here to get it right. Whatever that is, it changes. Brene Brown. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good one. Uh, I'd say I think a very lovely way to kind of um, capture that in an easy way is I'm here to thrive. And I say that because um, I think surviving and being alive are, 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 you know, clearly a lot, especially right now during COVID is what we're focused on. Um, but I do a lot of, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking this year and writing about thriving and the difference between just merely surviving. And I'm a big survivalist, um, gone through a lot of stuff and kind of made it. But uh, I, I noticed that there's some people who are good at thriving. And I noticed that certain areas of my life I thrive in and others I merely survive in and how much energy it takes to survive. So, you know, to even capture that, um, you know, and put like a little uh, cap at your pop is I'm here to thrive. And in that, of course, you can't thrive if you're not surviving and alive. But that, I think, requires so much more creativity, so much more optimism. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that's great. Um, I'm here to be an active parent and member of my family. I, I think that's, let's elevate that because I know you, Amy. And I would say, um, you know, I'm here to, to have a great family, experience a great family. And you do that in everything that you do. I've met your family and uh, you're definitely on your, on your purpose for sure. Um, uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so let's talk about what these bricks mean. Um, thank you for sharing. So now when we look at these bricks, um, these bricks are in layers. And I want you to think of the bricks as things that you move, almost like if you're putting together different Lego sets every day. And um, so high priority bricks, this doesn't mean that they matter more than any of the other bricks. It just means that they're actively connected to your purpose. So if you, you know, Amy, I'm gonna use you as an example, you shared that the, the family piece, family is what is at that pop, then your high priority brick, um, you know, if being, being a good, good participant in your family, your family brick, your family is tangible. So your family brick is gonna be in the high priority. Your work brick, maybe it's in the high priority, but maybe it's actually a second layer. A second layer brick is something that kind of elevates what you're able to do in the high priority, but it doesn't directly impact pop. Um, and then a foundational brick is, it's really the most stable. So if you think of the high priority bricks, this is where you're going to have to invest the most time. You're going to have to take the most risks with. Your foundational bricks are the things that create stability in your life. That's the areas that you don't really want to take a lot of risk because they're st that, that those bricks being stable is what enables you to take the risk in these other areas. Um, yeah, when you were younger, you felt like the work was on top and it absolutely could have been. And you might have you might have shifted your pop. Your pop may have been different when you were younger, um, and uh, you know. And now it's shifted. So for I'll share a little bit for me. Uh, my pop, like I said, is and I don't think I always realized what my pop was, but I can tell looking back on my career choices that, that I remember being in the military, and I I worked for the NSA, um, and I was a Russian linguist. Now I was a Russian linguist before uh, Russia got cool again in terms of being somebody a country that we were concerned about. So I was in a weird time where um, in, in the NSA, the Russian linguists were kind of 
sent to the oldest buildings, so to speak. Um, and I, I was deciding whether to re-enlist or to get out of the military. And I just remember going, I just don't feel like I'm doing anything meaningful. And the sergeant was like, what do you mean you're not doing anything meaningful? You're serving your country, you're doing all this. And, and I just thought, I think I'll, I'll be better off outside of the military and, and controlling how I, how I serve my country, so to speak. What I realized is I want to help people be their best selves. And, and the work that I was doing as a linguist had nothing to do with that. Now I get in trouble because at, you know, I worked night shift and I would bring in Cosmo magazines and talk to the Navy SEALs and, um, you know, Hey, you know, ask them these little, you know, self-assessment questions, which now I'm, I do much more official self, uh, assessments like DISC and whatnot, but uh, basically Cosmo quizzes is where I got my start. Um, so yeah, so I was, was doing all that and I got more meaning out of these Cosmo <laughs> quiz conversations than I did out of my job. And now in hindsight, I can see, well, of course, because that connected to helping people explore who they are and who they want to be. And so, yes, Malati, I, I'm surprised we didn't talk about that. But yeah, so that's uh, some of my random background. So anyways, my, my high priority brick has always been work. Work is, you know, I, I, I've, I've not always had the smoothest personal life, so I don't profess to be somebody's, you know, personal life coach or, or therapist. But work has always been some place that I, I've, I've had a chance to thrive. And so I've, I've really, that's where I see my work brick being very much at the top. It connects closely to my pot. Um, and then um, the secondary brick, for me, those things are like education. Um, I'm constantly reading, constantly trying to find different ways and keeping on top of what's really happening um, in the workplaces, as well as travel. The more I travel, the more I understand how work feels and looks across the globe. So those are my secondary. They don't directly impact my purpose like work does, but they feed it. Um, and by the way, money, my money brick, and your money brick is always a brick, it's tangible. My money brick is in the high priority area because the more financial freedom I have, the more I can um, help people. I, I have a nonprofit where I help uh, veterans and I help um, uh, domestic abuse survivors and people just who are struggling getting back into the workforce. But I can't afford to do that if I'm not uh, in a place of financial freedom. So so that's how that plays out. My foundation bricks um, are probably very different than what you know, Amy, Amy shared. Is my foundation brick is, is family and friends. And the reality is, is I, I don't take a lot of risks with them. Uh, the biggest risk I took is getting into a relationship a couple of years ago with, with stepkids, and that was a big risk. Uh, and they've been fighting to be, you know, for a while there, they moved up and they had to be secondary and sometimes even high priority because to get a, you know, a family kind of situated and, and, and settled. But my goal was to get them back to being foundation bricks because I can't really do what I'm meant to do um, if it requires a ton of time and a ton of risk and a ton of emotional uh, energy. And so I had to work really hard on quickly building trust, quickly building, you know, a, a lot of self-sufficiency and autonomy and that type of thing. Um, and so, and, and even in the relationship, really balancing, because I'd say, you know, my boyfriend's family brick is in the high priority side. And so learning how to coincide with someone who's got a completely different pop. Um, so that's all. But, you know, as, as Amy shared earlier, the bricks can move. So for like a year or two, my family brick really got moved up. Um, and then now it's in a place where, because they're, the kids are older and whatever, I can now put them back in a foundational area. Um, but when they're in a foundation, it doesn't mean they're, not, they're, they're unimportant. It means that you take less risks, you may invest less time, um, and it looks different. Um, but so my brother, on the other hand, his work brick and money brick is actually foundational. He's not all that, he loves to travel, but he's not, he's not as fancy as I am. He's, he feels free to travel um, uh, as low budget as he can. It's more about experience for him. And so he, he doesn't have a high priority money and uh, work brick. He works for the patent office over on the East Coast. And it's a government job. It's very low risk in terms of turnover. They, they, you know, the government doesn't tend to, to furlough and lay off people as frequently as private sector does. Um, you know, he's, but he gets a ton of vacation from the job. Here's the thing. The brick serves its purpose and my brother is great at his job. So don't feel like if you put, and I think I'm great at, at family, at the type of family that I've developed. So don't think that just because you've put something at a lower, lower level that, that it's not important or that you won't be good at it. 
So I encourage you, I'm going to actually send you after this um, webinar a, a worksheet that will have this little pyramid on it and, and it will have a second page that has all the details up to what I just described. So you can spend some time with this and you're going to get my email address. If you want to send me um, a worked out version of your, of your pop pyramid, I'm happy to look at it. I'm happy to, to, to chat uh, about um, if you've got any questions. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to keep um, moving on. Uh, but if you will, well, pause any questions or any, anything around um, how you can kind of get clear around where your priorities are. Um, and, and you can just use this year. You don't have to do it for a lifetime, but the pop is kind of your North star. Any questions around that? Or we feel, we feel like we understand it. I take silence as golden. Okay. All right, I'll keep moving, but feel free if something pops up to, to send me over a question. All right. Um, so we talked a little bit about what our pop is. So the next new rule uh, that I, I want to make sure that we talk about is think like a business owner versus a student. And I, I emphasize this uh, in, in almost all my classes. Uh, it is, we're really groomed in our careers to kind of expect this really organized career plan. Um, I think that's an old school way of thinking. We got, we got it ingrained in us. Um, and first of all, how cute is this girl on this picture? I, like I saw this picture, and like I have to find a way to use it into a presentation. She's adorable. Um, anyways, I digress. But, but when it comes to being a business owner, we think like students and we get caught up, and I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about promotions, is this idea that if, I'm, if I do get straight A's in 11th grade, what am I guaranteed? So you tell me, if I get straight A's in 11th grade, what am I guaranteed? Send it in the chat. Back when you were in 11th grade, you got straight A's, it's the end of the year. What do you know for sure? Scholarships for college? Maybe. Maybe I, 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 you know, that's, there's increased opportunity. You're guaranteed to graduate. Uh, then I won't have to go to summer school. <laughs> you are guaranteed nothing. If, if anything has taught us 2020, um, that you would move up to 12th grade. You go to the next grade. Never had that experience, expectation of acceptance in university. Uh, promoted to 12th grade, no summer school. Yeah. Um, the tradition is, is if you get straight A's or passing grades um, for 11th grade, you're guaranteed to go to 12th grade. Um, and yeah, you won't have to do summer school. Um, so those are the guarantees. The scholarships increases the chance. I got straight A's. I didn't get any scholarships, partially because I wasn't in the middle of applying for scholarships, but um, that's, that's on me. Um, but I moved to 12th grade. They don't say, you know, we're not sure we have enough. Uh, we really need 12th grade right now. Um, maybe they're going to do that after what's going on here. Um, they don't say, we're not sure, um, you know, you're, you're a good fit for 12th grade. Uh, we like you in 11th grade. You do well in 11th grade. Let's keep you there. Um, and so uh, guaranteed graduation, socially boost your confidence, go to a good college. Um, back then it meant high paying jobs. Yeah, right now the only guarantee is you get moved to 12th grade. Like, that's the guarantee. Everything else, um, I know a lot of people who got good grades in high school, they didn't necessarily go on to college and that type. that's not a guarantee. It's increased possibility, but it's not a guarantee. The 12th grade, guaranteed. So. That's a certainty. And what we do is we take that method um, and then we, um, yeah, for all C's as well, passing grade. So we take that thought process and we, we bring it into the workplace and we think, well, I've done a good job. I got a good performance review. Where's my guaranteed move to the next level? And that's not how business works. In business, you're not guaranteed anything at any time. Um, you, you have a lot of situations where they increase the chance that something will happen, the likelihood that something will happen, but even that can be a moving target. The beauty of it is, is you get to carve out a lot more. I mean, 12th grade was decided for you. The majority of classes that you took in school were decided for you. You got to pick electives, but even the electives were from a pool of things that someone else came up with. When it comes to business, there is a lot of freedom. And because the way that employment has shifted over the last couple of decades, as, as unsettling as it is that companies can lay off or reorg or technology has really rapidly increased this, the pace of change, it has opened the door for us to be really entrepreneurial, even if we decide to work within company. So as a business owner, you get back in the driver's seat and it's not about has my manager 
uh, planned my career out with me. And that's not leaving managers off the hook. I'm, I'm big on managers should um, have these kind of conversations. Um, but, it, but it is about, I'm in charge of this business. And that means I'm doing business. I've just decided to set up shop underneath the broader umbrella of a larger company. And a lot of you have sat through classes with me and heard me kind of talk about this on frequent occasions. But under that, if I'm working for a larger company, I'm not an employee. I'm a business owner. Maybe I file my taxes differently. Maybe I've reduced some of my risk because they're taking on some of the risk. But I'm a business owner. I'm providing a service. And I want to think through not what's my career path, because that's a little bit of a hamster wheel. How do I get them to promote me? Um, and instead, it's a, it's a business strategy of how do I want to expand? What kind of impact do I want to make? What kind of services do I want them to pay me for? And what position do I need to get them to put me in so I can do more of that? And how do I sell them and get them to buy into me helping them the way that I know I'm meant to help them? And that, that removes this idea that you're sitting in the passenger seat and you're hoping that you know, someone notices you or someone appreciates you or someone's going to you know, come up with some great way to leverage you in the future. You get into the, I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to think about that before someone else has to think about that for me. So um, I already asked that question. So a uh, new rule is also focusing on building your brand versus collecting titles. How do we feel about building brand? Some of you have maybe done a lot of work on it. Um, maybe some of you have uh, cringe at, at, at the idea of branding yourself. Uh, how do we feel about it? What do we think? Okay, so some of it's cringeworthy. I cringe, which may partially be because I don't know how to do it. Fair enough. Uh, get the concept and struggle to find it. It feels cringy. Branding works better. It does. Let's, let's, let's talk about how to take the cringe out of it. I think it's important at this point in my career. Uh, more on longevity with brand. Yeah. Um, that I need to do, but don't know how to do. Okay, so let's, let's chat about branding for a second. I'm gonna spend some time here. Um, here's how I look at it. I, I, I'm gonna share, I had a, a person reporting to me. We had a situation, it was, it was right after 2008's uh, economic downturn, and we were getting reorganized, uh, and the leader of the department was evaluating and looking at our team, and she said, um, I really want to, she's a great manager and she wanted to take into consideration since we were kind of reinventing what our team did. She's like, I, I would love to hear from everybody what they think they should be doing in the future uh, in the department, what they're passionate about as well. I, you know, I'm open to hear it. You know, you don't always get that opportunity. A lot of times managers just come in and tell you where to go. And so she was really taking the time to, to tr try to understand that. Um, and she asked this individual, I'm going to call him Bob. Um, and, uh, she asked Bob, you know, what is it that you want to do? And he says, look, wherever you need me, I'll go. And she goes, that's great. And I appreciate that. But I want you to put some thought into this of where you could, where you could be, because the role that you're doing is going away and I, I want to keep you. You're amazing. Uh, but what could you be doing? And he's, he, he just kept telling her whatever you need me to do, whatever you need me to do. So she basically told me, I'm going to have Bob report to you and you're going to do whatever it is that you do to figure out wh what he can be leveraged for. I don't want to lose him. Um, now I want you to notice he was making the job harder for her. Now he's a great guy and he, it, he didn't realize he was making it harder, but he was basically delegating to her the job of figuring out what he should be leveraged and paid for. And now if you think like an employee, that makes sense. As a business owner, you'd be thinking, well, no, I, I would never, you know, your plumber shows up and goes, I don't know, how do you want to, what should I do for you? Like, no, you should have a sense of like, what business are you in? What services do you provide? And you educate me and then I get to pick. Um, so he started reporting to me. And the first thing I talked to him about, I said, you know, let's talk about branding. And he just, he had, he's such a lovely man. And he just had this like, wolf and really like, ugh. Um, I, I've never seen him upset before. And I said, what is it? He says, it's just so gross. And I don't want to sit here and sell myself. And I just want to do good work. And so what I just said to him, and this really helped him turn a corner on this, I said, this is not about you selling yourself like schmoozing. This is about educating people how to get the best out of you and making it easier for them to know when to call you. 
And, you know, he comes from a strong service mindset. I think that helped him out a lot. And I, what the example I gave him is if you walk into a store and all the bottles, you're going in there for a bottle of shampoo and every bottle in the aisle is, is just white plastic. It's not labeled. And you've got to go through and you pick and you go, well, this smells like, you know, something that, that maybe is shampoo and you take it home and it turns out it's Clorox bleach and it just is scented lemon. Um, who are you going to be mad at? You're going to be mad at the, the manufacturer who's not labeling the bottles and making it easy for you to choose. That's what branding is. Branding isn't about I'm better than other people. Branding is this is what, my, what I'm about. This is what it feels like to work with me. And these are the services to think of me for. Um, so usually what I do, I don't have it set up here, but I'm, I'll give you guys a little bit of a homework assignment for those of you that are struggling with branding. Um, you know, please grab a, a notepad or a, um, you know, a computer, you know, to type this down. But the first thing I ask people to do is name your business. So imagine that you're setting up shop outside the company and they're hiring you as a consultant or a contractor. What would the name of your business be? Um, that starts to tell you a little bit about your brand. It might be Heather MacArthur, not, you wouldn't do this, but your name, Heather MacArthur Incorporated. It might be just as simple as that. And that tells me a lot. Part of your brand is very simple and easy to understand with no, no fluff. Not a problem. It might be, you know, um, efficiencies are us and, you know, it's got a fun little, little logo to it. But, but play with that a little bit because it, you'll actually realize that whatever you think of for your name of your company has a little bit to do with your brand and your style. Then I, then I like people to write out their service standards. What are your service standards? What is it that everybody who works with you should experience? What should it feel like? Is it fast and responsive? Is it slow and meticulous? Um, uh, my brand is Workforce Development Building uh, K-16 CTA Career Pathways, the education program. So now that's what you do, but let's add to that brand. Um, when you think about, I want, I want you guys to think about the how. How does it feel? What do I expect as a client or a customer? And that could be as a team member, as a manager. It's not just the traditional clients. It's everyone you work with. What are those things that I experience? So as an example for me, one of my brands is I'm casual. A big part of my brand is casualness. And, you know, I, 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 I think about that as I'm working in certain environments that are a little bit more formal. And sometimes I have to realize my brand's not a fit for a really highly, and I know I, I was in the military, you can imagine my struggle. Um, <laughs> but the, the very formal, traditional, really buttoned up kind of environments, unless they're bringing me in because they want to kind of bring more of a human element to things, that's the other side of my brand is very human, very, very uh, connect with the individual. Um, close kind of real dialogue versus distant and kind of aloof. Um, so those types of things, fun is another part of my brand. I, I like a little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of jokes. Um, so that's part of it. Earlier in my career, I didn't understand that. So I was picking jobs based off of what seemed like a successful path or maybe a good paycheck and not realizing I was shoving like a round, you know, uh, circle into a square, square hole. And, um, and that's where the struggle was. It wasn't that I wasn't you know, great at what I did. I just was picking environments that really weren't looking for the service brand, my brand of doing things. Um, so think about that. It's the name of your business and, and then jump into the how, um, I, I, you know, the clarity around what you do and then give a couple of tangible services. So for me, it's coaching, workshops, strategy and design, speaking engagements, pretty much everything I do a lot and it mirrors what we do as a firm um everything i do kind of falls under that i you know i don't do therapy i don't um you know i don't i, I don't really do a lot of technical training in terms of you know i used to do that earlier in my career it's not it, it requires such attention to detail that's the other side of it is i am not um i am a person who's very big picture and kind of creative my brand is not the meticulous person who can go through data. And Amy will tell you, <laughs> I'm not the person who goes through tons of data and notices the errors in there. I would have been horrible at accounting. And so knowing that about your brand and being able to describe that to people, I, I'm a couple of, of things that you can think of to add to your brand. Are you a sprinter or a long distance runner? A sprinter is get things done fast and you kind of want to do different things all the time. I'm a sprinter. It's part of the reason I like being a consultant. A long distance runner really has a methodical pace about them and they want to take something from beginning to end in the long run. They like to kind of be there for the, for the long term process of something in the day to day. And you may be a mix of both and that's fine too, just as long as you can kind of use those 
descriptions. I also bring out firefighter or city planner. I like to come in when things are messy and help make them better. I, I like to come in and fix something and then move on to the next thing. It goes a little bit with the sprinting and the consulting. Um, for the city planner, those are people who really want to sit down and build something and know that it's built on this kind of long-term uh, timeline. Um, are you a, a, a lone wolf kind of fighter or are you somebody who really thrives and kind of is a connector? So all those types of things, think of nicknames people have given you in the past and you can use those as a bit of a description. Um, like part of my brand is I'm a compassionate reality checker. What does that mean? It means that I'm always going to hold up the mirror and we're going to talk about what reality looks like, but I do that in a very compassionate way. So those little things, those little blurbs help explain how it might feel like to work with you. The last thing I'd say include on that list is what are your transferable skills? This is something I learned coming out of the military. As interesting as NSA and the Russian linguist sounds, unless I was applying to a bakery in LA, nobody cared that I spoke Russian at the time. And maybe it, maybe it would be better now, but uh, at the time, no one cared. And, um, and so I have to look at what are my transferable skills, the fact that I've, I've led teams, the fact that my communication and the way that I communicate and bring teams together. So thinking through what are those transferable that if I plucked you out of your job and put you in charge of a sanitation department or put you in charge of a fast food restaurant, there's at least four to five things that would show up about you no matter what job you did. The fact that you're highly organized, the fact that you make sense out of chaos, the, the fact that you are really good at um, you know, creating efficiencies in departments. Come up with what those things are. That all makes your brand. Now you can package it where it's, here's, you, know, you can have a nice way of looking at it as like, here's the name of your business. I'm you know, Heather, Heather the Fixer. And, and then it could be the, ser the service standards. These are the service standards. I respond quickly. I, I have a quick turnaround time. Everything's creative, everything's fun. And I have a casual, real kind of interpersonal connection with folks. Then what does it feel like to work, to, to work with me? Um, you know, and it's, it's creative, it could be dynamic, um, it, very service oriented, very tailored to you. And then what are some, some ways to think of me? I'm a sprinter, blah, blah, blah. So that's the way that you can kind of build it out. You don't go give that brand to people, but you use that when people, when you're working with your manager and discussing with them, this is what it's like to work with me. This is how I tend to think and operate. How does that work for you? Where does that cause some challenges? So I had that discussion with a manager of mine and I said, you know, look, I'm, I, I remember I had them, they were trying to, and this was great. They were trying to groom me to move up into, you know, different levels of HR. And I had to have an honest discussion of long term, I'm, I'm going to go back to consulting. And I said, in the meantime, really think of me as the firefighter, like put me into the nastiest, nastiest of issues or things that nobody else wants to deal with, or even high pressure situations. Totally fine. I'm not your city planner, like the person that you want on this project. And I knew who the city planners were in my department. I'm like, they're your city planners. They're going to be here for the long haul. Um, I'm going to be here, I'm going to help, and I will eventually go back out to consulting. And so that was just an honest dialogue I had with them because I could see that they wanted to leverage me for this. Uh, another honest conversation, um, that same manager that was kind of really great in trying to understand what people want to do, wanted to give me logistics. So I had all of learning and she wanted to give me logistics. Now, logistics has, had a lot of budget tied to it. So it, it, is, it, it would have been like a, oh my gosh, yeah, I get all this budget and it's, it's kind of like a little empire that I'm building. So a lot of people were, were vying for that. And I told her, I said, I, I got to be honest, if I'm running logistics and I, I have no problem taking it on if you need me to, but I will strip that to the leanest version of logistics and, and really miss the art of what logistics does. And I happen to know that someone on our team was really passionate about what logistics can do to really create learning experiences. And I'm like, she, she really is the person to talk to. Now, if she can't do it for some reason, I'll be functional but my brand is really that creative space of design and it's the ability to be strategic with clients. The logistics piece I do as a survivalist piece, but not as a, an art or a passion. And uh, because we had that discussion, the other individual ended up getting logistics. And I just believe that I, you know, the more and more I can build my career around the 80% of what I love to do and only 20% of the stuff that, you know, it enables me to do more of that, but it's really not my, my gift or my genius. Um, the more I get out of the job, the more people get return on investment for paying me for things. Um, and it worked out great. So those are ways that you can use branding. It doesn't have to be like, hi, I'm Heather. I'm the fixer. This is this. This is about me. 
it just helps educate people on how to leverage you. So hopefully that helped a little bit, um, give you something to think through. And you know what I'll do is I, I send tip sheets after this. I'll make sure that I send a tip sheet with a little worksheet around some of what I talked about for brand so that you can use that. You can feel free to send it to me. We can always set up some time to talk about it if, if you wanna help flush that out a little bit. Okay, uh, moving on. This goes a little bit to this, but uh, build a skill web versus climb ladders. Uh, I've sat on hiring panels. I've sat in talent planning sessions and um, all the way up through executive positions. And I will tell you that more and more the discussion for leadership, if that's the path that you're taking, um, isn't did they get promoted very quickly in one department, which used to be you know, a, a green flag for, for moving into leadership. Now what they're looking for is what's that dimensional experience do you have? Did you work in different functions? Have you led different types of teams? What variety do you have? So when I say build a skill web, don't assume that everything has to be a straight line in your career. Um, look for those opportunities to take on different things so that you've got some diversity. It also speaks to agility. Even if you're not moving up into leadership positions, the more you're able to take on different dynamics, the more agile your career is, and the easier it is for you to build a brand that's broader than the job you happen to be sitting in. Uh, I, very frequently, a lot of us are sitting in jobs that won't exist five years from now, and five years from now, we'll be sitting in jobs that don't exist today. And so instead of getting too caught up in what job you're in now or department you work in, detach from that a little bit and go, what skills set me up to be in demand, regardless of what's going on in the economy. Um, so just to have that resilience ar around your career. So that, you know, sometimes taking a job that's, that's you know, a, a level change, but not a, not a I'm sorry, a, a move to horizontal change, sometimes a step back. I've seen a lot of CEOs who got there because they took certain positions that were step back or smaller organizations, and then they eventually built up this wealth of knowledge of what it is to lead an organization. So really think about the impact you wanna make and what skills are behind that versus how fast you can climb the ladder. Um, regardless of your path, that's gonna set you up to be more resilient. And last but not least, um, uh, around the new rules is this behave like a thermostat versus a thermometer. And you know, I stole this from somebody, I'm not even sure who, um, but I've used this for quite a while. And it's, it's what I'm seeing more and more, especially during COVID. Um, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of fear um, that is running around. And when you operate like a thermostat, it, it is harder. It is more complicated, it's more complex. Um, that means you're setting the temperature in the room. You're walking in and you're going, this is going to be a positive engagement. This is gonna be a positive dialogue. I'm not gonna let fear drive my behavior here. Um, that means when people come in hot at 105 degrees and you're, you're set at 70, you have to work harder to get that, for them to come meet you at that 70 degrees. A thermometer is some, something, this is when we just react to whatever, whatever's happening. And I always know when someone's being a thermometer, when they say to me some level of, but Heather, you don't understand, you have no idea what this person just did. And I'm like, no, I do understand because as a thermometer, you had no choice, you had to react. And yes, it's justified because as a thermometer, they got hot, of course you got hot. Uh, they went cold, of course you went cold. As a thermostat, that's not what you do. As a thermostat, you don't have a rationale of because it's hot outside, I stop working or I start getting, I start to heat the place. The rationale is I work harder. And if I'm noticing that I'm working so hard that I'm about to break down, that I need to figure out how to keep myself repaired. And maybe that's taking myself out of the situation. Maybe that's, um, you know, working with a, you know, my support team or whoever that might be, my network, so that I can come in and really continue to show up at that 70 degrees. It also helps you keep your stress levels down. To be a thermostat, you really have to be able to tell yourself stories of optimism, stories of possibility, stories of good intent, even if it was bad delivery. That keeps your stress levels down and that self-care is part of it is not just, did you take a bubble bath? Did you take a walk? It's what are you saying to yourself, especially during this COVID time and with career stuff being questionable for a lot of people. Um, but they're, they're, they did a poll about, I, I don't know, two, two or so years ago, I do not think the results would have changed. Um, they did it through LinkedIn and it was for companies, what are the top things that you're hiring for? And two things tied for number one. One was the ability to adapt to and identify the change needed. And this is gonna be especially so right now. The other one was the ability to get along with people quickly and in a variety of situations. 
And especially now we're starting to see all of this, um, you know, kind of things coming up addressing civil unrest, such as the Me Too movement last year and now Black Lives Matter. And you're seeing that come into the workplace. And this idea of what I call cultural intelligence, are you able to work in a lot of different cultural varieties, build trust, and get work done. At the end of the day, we need to be able to throw people into a lot of different circumstances with a lot of different personalities and styles and, and know that you can figure out how to get people to, to work and get along and that a lot of personal issues aren't causing conflict in a negative way um, or toxic environments that people feel safe to work with you. So that thermostat piece, you'd be amazed at how much, when it comes to brand, how people feel working with you, this thermostat piece has a lot to do with that. Okay, when we um, think about the thermostat piece, I break it into three mindsets. Safety mode, which is not, this is the thermometer full tilt. This means I'm so, I'm so worried about my survival. Everything is very fear driven. Um, there's a level of stress that I'm operating in. Everything that people are saying is starting to feel like it's an attack or maybe it means something nefarious. And um, I'm a little bit like a drowning person lashing out at anybody coming at me, even a lifeguard. And so you probably have seen people like that, but ask yourself, have you been like that even for five minutes um, anytime this week so far? The next layer is um, looking good mode. And I, I think a lot of this situation right now has triggered a lot of people's looking good mode. Do I look good to my boss? Do I look good to my team? Do they know that I'm busy? Do they know that I'm productive? Do they know that I, I'm good at what I do? That's our looking good mode coming through. It's still fear driven. It's not as, as visible as the safety mode, but it's you know that everything you're doing, there's a level of I'm doing it so that certain people think of me in a, in a certain way. Even the branding question, am I, is that brand honest or are you building a brand so that others like you? So, you know, the brand should be authentic to who you are. Um, so that looking good mode, how much time have you spent there? And then the third one is the strategic and helpful. Um, this is where you're full of optimism. You trust that things will work out. You, you tell yourself like, look, you're smart, you're resilient. You'll figure this out like you've figured everything else out. But let's look at what the right thing to do is for everybody, including myself but including everybody else. And let me just trust that things will work out. And then that allows your brain to be creative and focus on designing what you want. This is the part that sets you up to thrive. The looking good is about survival. The, the safety mode is about you don't believe you'll survive. So I'd love to ask you guys, um, you know, what, uh, what mode have we, oops. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, no, um, what mode have you been in safety? Looking good, strategic and helpful. What's been the most when 60% looking good, 40% strategic? That is an honest, honest answer. That's a very honest answer. And I, I'd have to say I've probably been around the same number. Um, uh, yeah, no, no problem, Shelly. We'll send you the recording. Uh, depends on the week, mix of safety and strategic. Fair, fair. Like we, we can jump. Um, so just Start to be aware of that. When you start to sense yourself in safety mode or um, um, in that looking good mode, just start to ask yourself. I always like to, to, to really kind of tune into myself and what horror story am I telling myself? And how would I show up right now? What would I be thinking if I could guarantee that a year from now, I was in the best place I'd ever been? And it takes you out of the current situation it kind of soothes, it's a little bit of self-soothing and you tell yourself like a year from now, everything's gonna be great, what would I do? And, um, and start to get, you're inviting your brain to believe in possibility and it actually starts to calm it down. So a year from now, I'm in the best position. Um, and yeah, honestly, a mix of three, you're gonna, this, just watching television will cause you to go cycle through all three. So right now is a, a very important critical time to start to manage that. All right, um, I'm going to wrap up with a couple of last things before we, we close out for, uh, this hour. Um, anytime you're doing your career um, and you, you're working on your pop and we look at that, the next step that I do is I, I talk to folks about what stage are they at in the career planning process. If you're not sure what you need to do next, you just know you need to do something different, you're in exploratory mode. The thing that sucks about that is you don't know for sure what you want to do. The thing that's beautiful about that is it's exciting. It's an adventure. It's a time to kind of tune into yourself and what I call date life. Start to pay attention to what triggers you emotionally. Um, my, my experience was, is I was coaching people on their career and I, I could see that I was kind of 
burning out in my, in, my, in my job, and this is before I went back out to consulting, and my job was great. There was nothing wrong with my job, and I knew that. Uh, but I was getting burned out, and I, I started to notice these people jogging in the middle of the day as I'd go to work, and I'd get angry. Like, who are these trust fund babies, you know, jogging in the middle of the day? I mean, they might have been out of work actors and they had to, you know, lose five pounds to get apart. I don't know. But I was getting really frustrated. And so I started to pay attention to that. It basically, it spelled out, like, I was yearning for more freedom around where I worked, what I did, and how I spent my day. And, um, you know, after much time, and it wasn't a direct correlation, but it was a domino effect of me realizing it's time for me to go out to consult. Um, so exploratory mode is this, this kind of nebulous time that, that freaks people out because they don't have a clear answer, but it's actually an important stage. So if you're in exploratory mode and you're in a, in a position, which it sounds like every majority of people were, were sharing that they were employed um, or, you know, working. So, or if you're in a situation where you're, you're, you really need to get work, get the paycheck, but in the meantime, still spend the time to explore what you really want to do. The next phase is once you're clear about what you want to do, now it's, well, how do, I, how do I make that happen? This is the research mode. The good thing is more clarity. The hard thing is a little bit more risk. You've got to start reaching out to folks. You've got to start kind of actually putting some energy towards figuring this out. This may be scary for some people because they may have realized they want to do something that feels very different than what they've done before or feels like they've, they're doing something that feels like it's stepping outside of their comfort zone. The last stage is taking action. You know what you want to do. You know what you need to do, now you need to start doing it. And uh, this is where I see a lot of people get stuck because this is the highest risk factor. It's got the most clarity, but it requires the most risk, most work. And now you've really got to notify people that this is what you're up to. Um, all three stages are critical. Don't try to microwave through any of them, but honor where you're at and don't get frustrated with yourself if you're in a stage that you, you didn't think you should be in. Um, okay. Um, go ahead and throw in there what stage of career you guys think you're, you're in. Um, feel free to, if it's exploratory, if you don't want to share, you can send it privately to me or feel free to just think to yourself about it. Um, so here's a couple of tips and I'm going to send this out as a worksheet. Uh, if you're currently working, pay attention to the big picture. Really pay attention to what's going on with the company. Pay attention to beyond your own department. Some of you may already be doing that, but this is not the time to sit back and go, well, that's not my area. That's not my area of expertise. Um, I love a lot of research and taking action. I've got a feeling there's some exploratory folks out there. Um, next, look for opportunity to make a positive impact. Don't worry about, is this my job or not? Just go, what services are needed? How can our function be part of that? How can my role be part of that? I'll worry about later whether I'm getting the right title and the pay. Now that means that later when things are more stable or fruitful or profitable, then yeah, have that conversation. As a business owner, you have to negotiate with your client. But for now, be of service, make an impact. Partner as a resource versus someone to manage. Um, I see a lot of people go into their, into their um, managers and they, they come to them with problems. Now's the time to come in with solutions. Even if you've got an issue, let them know what you're doing about the issue. Ask them if there's anything they want you to consider other than what you're already doing. And notice that feels very different than, oh, that department over there won't work with us. We need it fixed. Now we're delegating issues to the manager who's probably really got a lot of stress on them as well. But as a business owner, you come in and go, there is this issue, here's what I'm doing about it, here's what I'm recommending, this is where I think it's critical for you to step in, this is, and this is where I don't think it is, what do you think about that? What would you like to change up? Notice that that's someone coming in and helping them work through their day and their issues versus adding to it. If you're furloughed, um, get real about your wiggle room. Um, uh, yeah, and learning, learning programming to jo uh, broad, broaden job opportunities. Uh, great. Uh, develop branding and presence. Use your social media to start showing that you are a, a person who is, is not just the role that you were in before you left, because chances are things are going to shuffle a little bit. And then prepare your plan B. By all means, um, you know, hope for the best that you get to come back to work with your current company, but have a plan B in place. Go ahead and start applying. You can always say no to things. Um, but you, you do have to take care of yourself and your own employment. And at this stage in the game, if you've been furloughed for a while, um, or even just, just recently been furloughed, um, I, I, I don't think it's disloyal uh, to make sure that you've got gainful employment. Um, laid off, get real about your wiggle room, same thing. Uh, are you financially set up to be able to take some time to really think through, do, the, do a lot of purpose work and that type of thing? But if not, then focus on how do you get some work that pays the bills and in the meantime, that doesn't mean that you have to marry that job. That can be something that helps pay the bills until you figure out or get back into the industry that you want. 
Create your marketing tools, make them marketing tools. Resumes, LinkedIn profiles should tell a story about what, what impact you make, not just a history of what you were responsible for. And then build your ABC strategy. That means um, find the jobs that are your ideal. That's the A jobs. Look for jobs that you're qualified for, but not in love with. That's the B jobs. And the C jobs are the paycheck jobs. I have a resume for each one. And then I'd recommend, you know, sending out as many resumes and applying, you know, I glitter against glue in that situation if you need to get back to work. And I send out to the A jobs, the B jobs, the C jobs, and then just trust that you'll know what kind of decisions to make as opportunities start coming your way. You'll be amazed at what it might even just do to you to get phone calls, even if they're not the A jobs, but for you to just feel back in the mix of talking about what you do for a living. There's some books on here. I, I'm going to point out that Low Man on the Totem Pole is, is, is one of them. That's my book. A lot of what I talked about today is captured in that. Uh, also, I've got a Low Man on the Totem Pole blog uh, uh, podcast that you can uh, listen to for free. And uh, some articles on Forbes, you can search by my last name uh, to find my column. Uh, those are free. And then of course, um, these are the, this is the worksheet that you're gonna get. Um, that's gonna be sent to you by email. And then uh, we'll send you the recording and a little survey on how this workshop ran. And we're here to help. So if you need coaching workshops on topics like this or others, team building, strategic planning, or speaking events, please feel free to reach out to us. You've got our phone number, our website, and my email address. I'm going to hang out for a while. So if people got other questions, um, uh, you know, by all means, start shooting them through. Uh, but for the rest of you, I hope you have a great rest of your week and hopefully found some tips that were helpful in here. Have a great day.